Aloha. This is uh, the state of the state of Hawaii on ThinkTech today. And I'm your host, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And welcome you to this program, which is uh, looking at the topic of um, education in the state. I, uh, I, want, would, I have a guest here to talk to us about the, um, and the, a, a person with, it, who's informed to talk about the enormous amount of, of funding that is actually unprecedented uh, for elementary and secondary uh, education. In fact, it includes preschool. So this is uh, the most ever distributed uh, to all the states. And this all began about March of 2021, a uh, year or so ago, um, when several laws uh, started being signed by the president. And in total to date, uh, we're um, more than $122 billion for P or preschool through 12th grade schools. So of these funds, um, and our um, expert guest will tell us a little more about this, Hawaii receives about uh, 700 million. So the DOE um, is working, the Hawaii uh, Department of Education is working to distribute the funds and in, in, uh, equitably for the needs that post COVID we along with all the other states uh, have. And so those are of course safe reopenings, regular in-person teaching back to that and learning in classrooms. And this is all uh, to relieve um, the, the depredations and the destruction of COVID to a uh, pandemic to our education and to our children's learning. So today our guest is an education leader here in Hawaii, Sherry Nakamura, and she directs a nonprofit coalition um, for excellence in education, and so is Hey, and uh, the website is H-E, and then we have the Hawaiian apostrophe E, so you can look that up um, to learn more. So welcome, Sherry, to Think Tech, and, uh, and uh, thank you for participating in this conversation about funding uh, from the federal government uh, to Hawaii schools. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm so happy to be back again. It's really a pleasure to have you back uh, on such a complicated topic, but I, I think um, the way you can talk about it will simplify it. I think that I'll just say there are three major bills um, that have passed um, and the, uh, they're, they're called ESSER or Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. And there's ESSER one, two, and three. And in three bills along with another one, the GEAR, the governor's bill. But in those bills, uh, they are of different amounts and have come out at different times since March of 21. So if you could just, um, if you just can work with that structure, uh, we don't have to get so complicated about the specific names of the bills, but they all add up to that enormous number I mentioned before, about 122 billion for the country, the whole country, all the states and about 700 million for Hawaii. Now, is that about correct as you see it from your look at it? Yes, that's correct. Since um, I think it goes back to the beginning of the pandemic actually, um, that some of the funds started to trickle in and that would have been maybe April of 2020 as everybody may look back and see when the schools uh, closed um, because of COVID-19. And since then, uh, according to my calculations, it's been about 688 million uh, in various uh, tranches uh, that have come to Hawaii Department of Education. Some of it has come to the governor as well, and that's been allocated to our Hawaii DOE. Um, and so from that time until about 2024, so the last tranche of ESSER 3, and you're correct, there was ESSER 1, 2, and 3, but ESSER 3 was uh, roughly 412 million, I think, uh, that is uh, able to be spent um, until 2024. So it is an enormous, uh, unprecedented amount of money for uh, education in uh, our country, and for Hawaii, it's certainly a large amount. It, it is, and I'm I'm very happy to read that all of the states have submitted plans to the U.S. Department of Education through which this money uh, um, flows and then out to the different states. And all of the states have been approved. Uh, all of their plans have been approved for spending. So everybody's ready to go. 
So um, I think, you know, having passed through that gate, there's no reason to think that Hawaii would have any, any more challenge getting through that gate than anybody else, but just that they've all managed to get it done and get it through and get it reviewed. Now, as we go ahead, um, can you tell us a little bit about what happens now that it's kind of like systems are go? So, so what, what are the functions that go on here? Maybe you could tell us a little bit why you know this, why you would be able to uh, Okay. Yeah, so um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, I am a director of a community coalition, coalition called HEE. It stands for Hui for Excellence in Education. And we're made up of nonprofit um, representatives who are very uh, concerned and wanting to improve uh, our public education system here in Hawaii. Um, I follow uh, a lot of the um, policy making that goes on at the Board of Education, as well as the Hawaii State Legislature. And we provide a community voice uh, for uh, education policy. So uh, that's why I know so much about um, the details of of these funds and also about the you know strategic plan and the plans that the DOE presents to the Board of Education and the discussions that go back and forth. So you're correct. Um, all of the states, I believe, have been approved. You can imagine the federal government was quite liberal with getting the funds to the states because of our pandemic, uh, because of the uh, effects of the pandemic. Uh, we know that you know, kids couldn't go to school for a while. Uh, they had this hybrid learning where it was partially distance, partially in person for a while. And um, we've had a lot of uh, disruption in our school system. So Hawaii did submit a plan. Um, it was rather broad. In other words, they uh, looked at certain categories, you know, health and safety, maybe addressing academics or um, well-being. Um, and submitted it to the US DOE and got approval pretty readily. So um, since then, uh, there have been more detailed discussions at the Board of Education, and I've been able to follow them and also provide comment uh, to the board and the department. Well, you, you've had quite a bit of access, uh, and um, I'm very pleased that you have, and others too are there. So would you say that the process is rather open um, to input or open? Uh, yes, it is actually. Um, the hard part is sort of navigating uh, the process and understanding, you know, how the Board of Education uh, holds its meetings, uh, the agenda items. Uh, there, there are certain protocols. For example, you, you cannot comment unless uh, an item is on the um, agenda. Um, and so because I follow the, uh, the, the Board of Education meetings uh, pretty closely, I'm uh, in tune with you know, how the community can comment. But for somebody who is not following regularly, it could be very, very confusing. Um, but uh, my group, um, I mean, I'm happy to welcome any a community member who would like to learn about the process. Once you learn about it, it's, uh, it is quite, um, it is quite accessible. You can provide comment and get your voice heard. Well, when it gets down to the uh, actual uh, writing of um, the plan, who who's doing that? Is is that the DOE and their committees, or who's who's actually doing the plan and the budgeting for this? Yes. So because the federal funds went direct, a lot of it, or most of it went directly to the Department of Education. Uh, it's the leadership, uh, the staff at the DOE, Hawaii DOE, that uh, came up with the plan and is implementing it uh, as we speak. Um, I guess when you asked about, you know, how open uh, or how transparent everything is, uh, the DOE is very good at sort of giving a big overview of how the monies uh, shall be allocated. But what is difficult to find out um, is specifically how schools are utilizing these funds. And um, beca because there's not a sort of real time process on understanding, uh, you know, the 
programs or initiatives or how they're how each school is spending their funds. Uh, the only time we can understand uh, what a school is doing is maybe every year they have to submit an academic and financial plan, and that is public. So we can see that um, usually it's posted, um, you know, once a year and we can go look at it. But these federal funds are unusual in that it's come sort of at different times um, and uh, there ha the funds have been allocated. And so it's hard to really know how the school, how each school is using their, uh, this, these uh, supplemental funds. So that part is a little bit difficult to get a handle on. Well, in looking at the federal guidelines, I did find the sheet, which was a little different from previously. It wasn't as stringently explained or as clearly and specifically explained about what the requirements were. But then there's a new secretary, plus the whole notion of this allocation is to, to make things happen and make them happen fast. And I think there's probably a lot of uh, generosity for how it is that it's actually going to happen in the various uh, districts and states. But um, but I did notice that, um, and anybody can go to the U.S. Department of Education's website and, and wind their way through those uh, wickets on that website to find out uh, what the allowable uses are for the so that um, I just wanted to say in general, I, I thought it was interesting to know that like for ESSER 1, which was the first tranche, as you mentioned, um, there are 12 allowable uses. Mm -hmm. So that means there's guidance coming from the feds. So, I, I mean, I mean, this is for all the states. So everybody's dealing with this. And I uh, suppose there would be more discussion and publicity if there were some issues. But then for ESSER 2, there's 15 allowable uses just to show that, you know, they're they're following all the same thing with ESSER or three, they also, um, they must spend 20% of the money on addressing the impact of lost instructional time. Mm -hmm. I think, it, so I, there is a, a framework around which people are working. Do you, do you see, the, do you hear anything about this in, in the discussions of those working on this budget about what the well, feds to do as yes uh, um i think the federal guidance even though there are maybe 12 requirements is still very broad okay. and yes i think basically i i interpret it as perhaps um two large buckets really addressing health and safety and then addre addressing what they refer to as learning loss um some school districts refer to they don't really want to uh refer to it as learning loss, but rather learning acceleration, because mm. due to the effects of the pandemic, um, the truth is a learning loss did occur because there wasn't uh, enough or there wasn't as many uh, instructional hours, kids had to be online. And so the government, the federal government wants uh, each state to be able to supplement uh, their uh, the schools so that, you know, we can regain sort of this instructional time, use um, effective instructional strategies to get kids back on track, because there was quite a bit of, of, of slippage in perhaps, you know, academic performance, because there was more absenteeism, um, or kids were affected emotionally, socially, and emotionally by the pandemic. So the supplemental funds are really to address, uh, this category of learning loss or learning acceleration. So it's health and safety because we are still going through the pandemic. So we wanna make sure our schools is, are as safe as possible, as well as addressing maybe the social, emotional needs of students, as well as the academic needs. So I really see it as two big buckets, um, even though there may be you know, more uh, uh, um, criteria that has been defined by the federal government. Well, I noticed that there was a survey um, of 600 school superintendents that showed um, that th those school leaders were using um, the funds uh, for students' mental health and development needs. Mm -hmm. So that looks like um, it's a big priority. And, uh, and another survey, they're starting to do more of them now, but these are just two examples. Another survey showed 82% of the district plan uses uh, for social, emotional, mental, and physical and health development. Um, because um, the, this is like um, 
children of war, you know, who have really been deprived of, of these services. So the, the effects of that are can, can be, you know, can vary widely among. Correct. So uh, I, as a matter of fact, I did um, speak to a superintendent uh, on the mainland who um, did a an needs analysis of his district. And they really found that, um, you know, the pandemic caused a lot of emotional stress on students, uh, even the high performing students, because they weren't able to go to school uh, at first. Um, he, he mentioned that you know they sort of lost the will to uh, to 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 try hard to study hard. Um, they kind of um, some of them you know sort of dropped dropped out or checked out of the whole uh, of of going to, of thinking of school or what they wanted out of school. Um, but uh, you can imagine uh, kids who are perhaps in uh, economically disadvantaged areas. I think uh, the factors are were um, you know overwhelming um, because now you weren't able to go to school and you had to use computers and do distance learning. So I think the um, the the mental health of students really uh, was affected um, by the pandemic. So uh, I, I'm not surprised that uh, many districts did um, use the federal funds to to address uh, the mental health needs of our students? Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that from um, the, the year before the pandemic, as I recall, we, we were really in the hole. I mean, everybody, the budget was really a kind of a crisis about what was gonna happen in the economy of Hawaii and all of that. And then of course, then the pandemic, and then now with this enormous uh, benefit um, what are you, are people excited about, can you tell us a little bit about the affect of that, or is there any, or is it, oh, it's more work, I mean, what, what where, where, where are people coming from, is it scaring them, or are they making, making them happy? Well, I think at the school level, you can imagine any uh, additional resources would be welcomed, and it is welcomed. Um, at the same time, though, uh, the, the effects of the pandemic have been so overwhelming that, even with more resources, I think uh, schools feel very um, um, stressed to to try to get back to some kind of normalcy. So it's mixed feelings. Of course, if we didn't have the supplemental funds, it would be that much uh, more of a heavy weight on everyone's shoulders. But the fact that we have, um, you know, extra funds, uh, I think at least uh, we are able to provide more resources so that we can uh, slowly get our schools and our students back on track. I think uh, one of the questions, um, if we, since, uh, anyway, and one of the questions I had was what what changes might come out of this? You as a long-term observer and participant in these processes um, of trying to improve what Hawaii does for its public schools, do you see this experience making a difference for Hawaii schools? What, what might be the outcomes in addition to better things they can do because of all the money, more computers and roofs that don't leak, et cetera? I think that it is a tremendous opportunity to try to uh, use the supplemental funds to really understand uh, what's working and what's not working. Um, or maybe you try to find you know, exemplary uh, schools. Um, you know, even during the pandemic in Hawaii, there were some schools that um, you know, academic performance didn't slip as much as others. And maybe that was because there was a really effective or a, a, a mix of distance learning and in-person learning that they were able to optimize to really uh, make sure that kids stayed on track as much as possible. Um, I would hope that some of these funds are used to try to analyze and study some of these exemplaries so that we can uh, have them as you know, best practices going forward. Um, unfortunately, though, I believe the pandemic has really um, made things so uh, uh, difficult. Um, I think just, for example, when the Omicron uh, variant hit, you know, we had infections uh, happening um, 
many, many more infections happening and schools had to deal with, you know, kids being absent because they had to quarantine and then you had the testing issue. And there was a lot of disruption going on at the school level. That's why um, it, it's, it's really hard, I think, for the system to, you know, try to do some of these analyses that could, could really help uh, with the extra resources because they're just trying to deal with the day-to-day -day of battling, um, you know, what's going on with COVID. Hopefully, um, although, you know, I don't think anybody's really sure, Omicron has passed, hopefully we'll have some stability in our system so that we can do some of these analyses and, uh, you know, really identify some best practices so that we can be able to share them across the state. That's what I'm hoping. Um, but I think the situation is so uncertain that it's difficult to, um, to know whether or not uh, that kind of thing could even happen. Well, you know, there's an element of, I guess it's not so much competition, but maybe comparability that's introduced in this process, Sherry, isn't it? Because all of the states are getting all of these funds and there's going to be a tremendous interest in assessing their progress and that seeing what these outcomes are and seeing which ones are doing what and who's getting where. So how do you feel Hawaii will fare in that sense of it. That's well, I did want to bring up something that uh, I found, which was um, found in Hawaii that wasn't really uh, um, a big significant factor in other districts. So uh, on the mainland, uh, I should mention that um, most states have districts and some states have many districts and uh, it's the funding is, is uh, by um, property tax for that particular district. Hawaii is very unique in that um, we have only one district, it's the state. And so even though we have different islands, we are one state system and we're one district. And our funding is determined by the state legislature. So it's the state general funds that, um, that uh, fund education, not property tax. So we're different. Um, I think there is an element of a greater stability on the mainland with uh, property taxes funding um, education, because in Hawaii, uh, I'll just take 2008 as a, an example, when we had a, uh, the great financial recession, our state funds shrunk and we weren't able to um, fund education fully. And that's why we had furlough Fridays. Uh, we had to actually close schools because we didn't have enough funding to pay the staff to open schools. Uh, similarly, uh, with the pandemic, uh, tourism shut down. So our state funds uh, uh, decreased and so did our budgets uh, or so did our monies for public education. Thankfully though, we did have a uh, um, the supplemental funds come in and that's really helping. So in Hawaii, part of our ESSER funds, actually it was a pretty significant amount of funds was used to sort of plug up the budget deficits. Um, and in other states where they, did, where they had more stable funding, they didn't have to use the federal funds to, to sort of smooth out the, the financial situation. They could actually just directly use it for addressing health and safety and also for accelerated learning or learning loss. But Hawaii, uh, quite a bit, a, a large chunk had to be uh, allocated towards sort of stabilizing the financial, uh, the financial situation, um, plugging up uh, budget deficits. And so that unfortunately is, is uh, is, is something that we had to deal with that other uh, districts did not. Oh, there may be other reasons for districts uh, um, in the many states to have uh, funding problems too, but, um, but Hawaii is susceptible because of the economy and the fact that they have to be funded by the, the, the state budget. Yes, I think that on the mainland with property tax, it, it's a little more stable. You don't get these wide swings in property values as you would do with our state uh, revenues. Our revenues are heavily driven by the tourist industry and 
when tourists don't come, everything goes down and education is, is a large portion of our state budget. So there's some of that. Um, so, but back to your question about whether or not, you know, Hawaii is going to uh, benefit or uh, be back on track um, as quickly as other states. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be hard to know uh, immediately. Uh, we are a very large state uh, district. Uh, there's 170,000 students. We have a $2 billion budget. It is a very large organization. So to get things going and moving uh, in a way that, um, you know, where changes can be made uh, um, progressively is, is very difficult. If you're in a district on the mainland when there's only 10,000 students, you're much more nimble. Uh, and with these extra funds, you could probably uh, initiate uh, some uh, um, uh, strategies more quickly. And so we have that disadvantage in that, uh, although we are one state, one district, we're very large. So it might be harder to, to move quickly. I, I think the other uh, issue um, going along with that, uh, I mean, if you've got skin, skin in the game, I mean, we're all paying taxes in Hawaii, right? So we've got skin in the game, but it's not so specifically as the money that's going to our district through our county taxes and our city taxes and the local school board and all of that. So um, do you think this might be a, a time when people aren't going to be more involved in what happens in the school? I mean, as this as more publicity comes out on what we're doing with this money and how it's affecting the different schools, I, I, I was wondering if you would see that people would pay more, and certainly for, with programs like this one, people would pay more attention to how things are are applied, how, how this budget is developed and how it's going to be um, deploy. Right. Well, that's, um, that's a hope of, of my coalition really to get uh, more, um, to get the public more engaged in what's happening uh, at public education. But I think uh, parents uh, who have children in our schools, our public schools, uh, they're very focused on what's happening at the school level with their, with their child or with their children. So I would imagine that a lot of parents don't even know that there's a, a tremendous amount of funding that's that's going to the school. You're not going to really see the effects of of this funding immediately. I think parents are generally uh, concerned about you know COVID still and um, if you know academic performance or social emotion or mental mental mental. mental uh, health and well-being has been uh, compromised or uh, their, their children have been affected by it, I think they are probably more focused on, you know, what can we do to help or what can the school system do or what can they do together to help their children get back on track to, you know, pre-pandemic levels. Um, so I don't think there is a general awareness that, you know, this tremendous amount of money has gone to the system. Um, but I think it is important, and I know that my coalition members feel it's very important to understand uh, how the department is allocating these funds, um, what their goals are, uh, what the, um, how they intend to meet these goals and objectives. And, um, you know, it is a one, I believe it is a one time unprecedented uh, opportunity and hopefully we can use these funds to do some of the things that I mentioned before, try to do an analysis or analyses on you know, exemplary schools so that we can learn from their, uh, these best practices and these effective strategies that uh, schools are using. So I'm hoping that um, it will um, spark a change, but right now it seems like parents and even community members it's more focused on uh, what's happening with their children if their children are attending public school. Um, I as uh, just to clarify on the difference, um, the the differences between um, Hawaii and other states' ways of funding the schools. But there are as many people that can can help with tutor. Like many of the many of the um, states are ramping up the, the tutoring, of course, right? So they're ramping up. Tutor, tutoring to, to help close these gaps and do it in the summer and even during school. So, but 
local people can, local schools can do those sorts of things. There's nothing about this system that prohibits uh, parents from doing things or, or, do, or does it tend to be more get coming from, you know, the bureaucracy down rather than the parent? I, so uh, in Hawaii right now in our school system, we have a distributive uh, uh, leadership um, system where schools have a lot of flexibility and um, so schools can choose to uh, implement a tutoring program uh, if they would like. Um, the supplemental funds could certainly be used for that. Uh, and if they feel that that's gonna help their, their students in their community, they can certainly um, uh, execute on a program like that. I think what's difficult uh, is the actual planning and getting it going. Because if you think about it, there's 256 uh, public schools um, and there's uh, more charter schools. If every school had to go and figure out a program on their own, on top of all of the things that are happening at the school every day, it's a big lift. So what I'm sensing is uh, on the mainland, um, maybe their district, so the district office um, is, is more... Um, uh, how should I say, unified to be able to, you know, coordinate that for the schools. So maybe a district would select a tutoring company or, you know, a, a tutoring, tutoring consultants and maybe provide a menu for the uh, school so that they could, they could implement this program sort of district wide. In Hawaii, even though we are one state and one district, you know, in theory, we could do that for the whole state. But because of this distributive model, um, we're not set up to do that. So the schools have to. The schools will will do it if they feel that it's important uh, for their students and community. But you can imagine just getting the coordination and and executing it yeah. is uh, not going to is not very easy. Well, it sounds like to me that we'll there there will be interesting developments as we're going forward and what my hope is that we can increase the the awareness of this wonderful benefit uh, for this state as well as all the others and how the whole country can afford this is another question <laughs> <laughs> Got it, and it's cat, and it's in hand. So let's see what happens um, as uh, we get more publicity and we hear more from the department about what's going on and what their challenges are. Hopefully, they'll be sharing more about that. And then things that you and your community are trying to do, um, and and having success or are challenged by. Let's let's talk more about that and continue to raise awareness about Hawaii schools and and their their enormous uh, opportunity in this situation to. Uh, have things happen to them that might not have happened before and and for the children to get to be as uh, as as uh, to reach their potential as they can yes i would um i would love to have the community more engaged uh in understanding what goes on at our public school system um i think the more people that are engaged uh the more we can you know cooperate and uh, help the department in areas where um they couldn't without the community. So uh, I'm eager to, to help do that. Really good. All right, I think we'll um, say it's Aloha. I mean, it is Aloha time now for this show. And uh, I'm uh, your host, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton for the state of the state of Hawaii. And our guest is uh, Sherry Nakamura, the director of, um, of you said Hui a little differently than I do, Hui for excellence in and uh, please take a look at the website and uh, let's stay in touch with the news and uh, we'll be back talking about education as a state agency and function of the state of Hawaii again soon. Thank you and aloha everybody. Mm -hmm.